Today I want to share with you something really awesome that my buddy Yorai shared with my boot camp last week. It's something that I think a lot of developers forget about and could really take advantage of, and that's with the animator state machine behaviors. I'm going to show you really quickly how you can use it in two different ways that I think are really interesting and extremely easy to use in your own projects. If you're not already actively using these things, make sure that you watch this because I think that you're gonna get a lot out of it. And make sure you also hit the thumbs up button, subscribe and drop a comment down below if you have any thoughts or ideas or things that you use these state machine behaviors for that I don't talk about today. So here I've got a scenario set up with a robot player and I've got a robot that can jump hit his head on these ceilings up above and duck down. And you can see that my collider shrinks down when I duck. So when I duck, I've got a small collider and I can go underneath things like this laser. And when I stand up, my collider's the big one that is so I can hit things like this laser. Now to make this happen, I've got two colliders that are just both on the player and I toggle between them when I'm ducking and when I'm not ducking. Now the code for this is pretty simple, but there's a problem. Let's take a look at the code and then the problem. First, we check to see if we're ducking by seeing if my vertical input is less than zero. So here I'm just reading our input using the new input system and throwing the Y value into the vertical input variable. So if it's less than zero, I'm pressing down. If that's the case, then we set the duck bool parameter on the animator to true. Otherwise we set it to false. And then if we are ducking, we stop ourselves from moving with setting our desired horizontal to zero. That's outside of the scope of this. But the next two lines are related. We toggle the ducking collider and the standing collider based on whether or not we're ducking. So if we're ducking, the duck collider's on. If we're not ducking, then the standing collider is on. What is the issue though? Why is there a problem? Well, watch what happens if I run over here, drop down, duck, and jump. Did you see my head go right through here? And take a look at the collider. The collider is also that short collider no matter what. And that's because right now my collider changes, and you can see it changing at runtime as I tap, whenever I adjust my input. And that's not really what I want to happen. I want it to be a short collider only when we're ducking. And there is a solution to that. That's the animator state machine behavior. So let's go take a look at how we could use that. If we go to the animator for this player, you see that it's got an item a duck and a jump. So we'll select the duck state on the animator, hit the add behavior, and then we'll create a new script called duck behavior. We'll hit create and add, and this is going to give us a new state machine behavior. It should open up the code and look a lot like this. You'll get a state machine behavior that has a bunch of commented out methods that you can and possibly should override. In this case, I want to override the state enter and the state exit. We'll do that by removing the comment parts right here at the beginning of the line. So I hold alt, drag, and select so that I can do my block delete. And then in the animator, or in this state enter, we'll call the animator, we'll say animator dot set bool, and we're gonna create a new Boolean parameter named is ducking. We'll set it to true, and then add the semicolon. I copy that line there, and then we'll do the same thing for on state exit, just block select paste and change this to false. So now when we enter this state, we'll set our animators is ducking parameter that doesn't exist yet to true and we'll set it to false when we exit the state. We jump back into Unity, press plus and add a new Boolean parameter called is ducking. And then the final thing would just be to change our player code so that we don't look at the duck parameter. Instead, we look at the is ducking parameter. So let's find our duck. And here we'll change this code. I'm gonna replace this variable with a should duck, or let's just call this duck. Pass that into our set bool, and then our new is ducking variable, so I'll say var is ducking, will be equal to animator dot get bool, and we're gonna read the is ducking. Then finally, we check to see if we're ducking and then modify our colliders using that. So we've just changed our parameters. So now we have an input parameter and an output parameter and we're reading that output parameter. Let's go try it out and see if we can now jump through this thing and have our head bounce through or if our collider actually updates properly. So come over here, I duck down, I jump, and look at that. The collider changes as soon as the animation switches instead of automatically. Let's pull up the scene view as well so that we can see it kind of side by side. 
get them both going, I, I think that it gives a better, clearer indication. You can see the collider right there, and I duck down, the collider changes. When I jump, it starts to switch as soon as I transition out of that behavior or out of that animation, and it goes back in as soon as I start to shrink back down. So that is the behavior that we want. And this is something that you can use for a lot more than just ducking. You can use this for things like an invulnerable state, an attacking state, or any other thing that you want to set as an output parameter. If you want to be able to read something from your animation, you can always use animation events. But these animation state behaviors, I think, are a little bit more powerful and a little bit easier to work with, at least from what I can tell. There's also a lot more to them. So let's dive into the second thing that you can use them for. But first, I'm really excited to let you know that we finally opened up the Game Dev Guild 2023 Early Bird Registration. Last year, we hosted the very first Game Dev Guild conference, and it was such a huge success that we decided to do it again, only bigger this time. We've added an additional two days to the event. Game Dev Guild is a big five-day conference specifically made for game developers. The conference features over 30 talks and live Q&A sessions with industry professionals and experts, and the sessions are focused on giving actionable advice that you can implement into your workflow and projects right away. This year's conference will be hosted from May 1st through the 5th and will feature a variety of talks on the most relevant topics in the industry today, like multiplayer, AI, graphics, dots, game design, and a ton of tips and tricks and a whole lot more. We're also aware that a lot of people go to conferences to network with other developers, which is why we've set up a full expo hall that gives you the opportunity to network with all the other attendees, sponsors, and speakers. Personally, I can't wait to chat with everyone again this year. For the first two weeks, we'll be offering an early bird discount on the conference pass, which comes with a ton of bonuses, by the way, including some of the most popular assets from the asset store. If this sounds interesting, go check it out by clicking the link in the description and make sure to get the early bird deal while it's still available. I definitely hope to see you there. Now, one of the most common things I've seen people run into as an issue is they've got a character that has a sub model underneath it that's the visual representation, but they want to use the Unity root motion system. So they've got a character, maybe they grabbed this one from Mixamo or something else that has walking animations. They want it to line up perfectly and look right. But when you enable root motion, the thing with the animator is what moves, this child object. So if I've got logic on my character parent here, well, you can see that my my character and my character's model are nowhere near each other, so things will start to fall apart. Now, there are two different ways that you can address this. One is through the mono behavior. We can implement or override the on animator move, but we can also do this inside of the state machine behaviors. Let's take a look at our animator again, and here you can see we've got a walking animation, and I'm going to add a new behavior to it. I'm going to add an apply root motion to parent behavior. Let's take a look at what this behavior's code is, and then and we'll see how it works in game. So we open it up and you can see that this one is overriding the on state move. I'm not doing the on state enter or the exit, just the move and inside of the move we're doing two things. Well, three because I've got a log entry here just to make sure I wasn't crazy. The first thing we do is set our animators transform parent, the thing that's holding this animator, to be or its rotation to match our animators rotation. Then we set the position to be moved by the amount that our animator has moved. If I go try this out in Unity, what we're going to see is that our, our parent object now is moving instead of the child one. Let's go check it out. So I'll press play. We'll watch our character model and look at the position here. You can see that the position and rotation is zero and the parent is moving. And this is pretty cool, but there's one other thing that I wanted to show you. Because while I've got this on my walking state, if I add a bunch of animations, I would have to go in and add this animation script or this uh, state machine behavior to all of those different states. I can remove this and click on the base layer here instead, just the background, and then add it to the layer in place of that. That way, when I add in multiple animations, this behavior will apply for all of them and then my root motion will work. So I hope that this was helpful. Like I said, this is a, a very useful thing that a lot of people just don't necessarily know about. And I think there are a lot of other really cool use cases for it. If you've got one, please drop a comment down below and let people kind of get their minds going and thinking about them. And if this was helpful, please hit that thumbs up button, subscribe and share. Also, don't forget to check out Game Dev Guild. It features tons of actionable talks from industry experts and gives you the opportunity to network with like-minded developers. The early bird offer will only be available for the first two weeks, so if it sounds interesting, make sure that you check it out by clicking the link and get that offer while it's available.